Now, we are continuing our um, study of the book of Nehemiah. We've been in at this for about five months. This is session 14 today. We've been noticing that it is more about restoring the heart of the people to God. It's less about restoring the physical walls around Jerusalem. The walls, of course, are important. It's not to say that they're irrelevant or unimportant. They are important. We've noticed, we've commented in the last few weeks, how the walls, once they were completed, once they were restored as they ought to be, they protected what was precious to the heart of God in the city of Jerusalem, particularly the, the temple. And God is particularly interested in our hearts. The verse in, Pro in Pro Proverbs 23, it says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. And we're in that section of the book of Nehemiah where the people of Israel are brought back to the heart of God. They've done the essential work. They've done the, the rebuilding that was required. And now God is bringing them back to learn to love his word again. And to learn in the process the importance of the need of not just loving God's word, but acting on God's word. As James says, not just being a, 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 a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word as well. And we've seen how the children of Israel trace the goodness and the provision of God for them. Not just in this moment of time, as they were rebuilding the walls, but throughout their history, right from creation right through um, the, the experiences of Egypt, the exodus from Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land, and so on. The whole history, they trace that whole history, and although they comment on their unfaithfulness, and how they deserted God's law, and so on, the theme that runs through that chapter, we notice, is God's faithfulness. God's provision for his people. And today, we continue this theme of, of restoration. Nehemiah orders the people and the spiritual leaders are identified in this section. Now, it's a lengthy section we're going to read. Um, Nehemiah chapter 11 into halfway through chapter 12. And please do bear with me, as I've asked you several times as we've been going through this Bible study... Um, there are lots of names in this section, names of people, names of places. Um, as I've said before, I've sometimes wondered, well, do we need to read all these names out? Well, the Holy Spirit has prompted them to be written in God's book. So who am I to edit and, and skip chapters out just because it has a lot, a, a lot of long, unpronounceable names? So your grace would be appreciated. So chapter 11 of the book of Nehemiah from verse 1. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the chiefs of the province who lived in Jerusalem. But in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his property in their towns. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in Jerusalem lived certain of the sons of Judah and of the sons of Benjamin, of the sons of Judah, Athiah, the son of Uzziah, son of Zechariah, son of Amariah, son of Shephatiah, son of Mahalalel, of the sons of Perez, and Maaseiah, the son of Baruch, son of Colhose, son of Haziah, son of Adiah, son of Joyrib, son of Zechariah, son of, Shalonite, of, of the Shalonite. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. And these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshulam, son of Joed, son of Bediah, son of Kaliah, son of Maaseiah, son of Ithiel, son of Jehiah, and his brothers, men of valour, 928. Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer, and Judah, the son of Hasanua, was second over the city. Of the priests, Jediah, the son of Joyrib, Jakin, Sariah, the son of Hilkiah, 
son of Meshulam, son of Zadok, son of Mer Merioth, son of Ahitub, ruler of the house of God, and their brothers who did the work of the house, 822. And Adiah, the son of Jeho Jer Jeroham, son of Pel Pelaliah, son of Amzi, son of Zechariah, son of Peshur, son of Malchijah, and his brothers, heads of father's houses, 242. And Amash Amashiah, the son of Azarel, the son of a Isaiah, the son of Meshilimoth, the son of Imma, and their brothers, mighty men of valor, again, 128. Their overseer was Zabdil, the son of Hegadolim. And of the Levites, Shemaiah, the son of Hashub, son of Azrikam, son of Hashabiah, son of Buni, and Shebathai, and Jozabad, of the chiefs of the Levites who were over the outside work of the house of God. And Metaniah, the son of Micah, son of Zabdi, son of Asaph, who was the leader of the praise, who gave thanks. And Bakbakiah, the second amongst his brothers. And Abda, the son of Shamua, son of Galal, son of Jadutham. All the Levites in the holy city were 284. The gatekeepers, Akub, Talman, and their brothers, who kept watch at the gates, were 172. And the rest of Israel and of the priests and the Levites were in all the towns of Judah, every one in his inheritance. But the temple servants lived in Ophel, and Zia and Gishpah were over the temple servants. The overseer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi, the son of Bani, son of Hashabiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micah, of the sons of, of Asaph, the singers, over the work of the house of God. For there was a command from the king concerning them, and a fixed provision for the singers, as every day required. And Pethahiah, the son of Meshezabel, of the sons of Zerah, the sons of Judah, was at the king's side in all matters concerning the people. And as for the villages, with their fields, some of the people of Judah lived in Kiriath Arba, and its villages, and in Dibon, and its villages, and in Je Jechabzeel, and its villages, and in Jeshua, and in Molad Molad Moladar, and Beth Pelet, in Hazar Shual, in Beersheba, and its, visitors, in its villages, in Ziklag, in Mechanar, and its villages, in Enrimon, in Zorah, in Jamoth, Jamoth, Zanoah, Adullam, and their villages, Lachish, and its fields, and Azakar, and its villages. So they encamped from Beersheba to the valley of Hinnom. The people of Benjamin also lived from Geba onward at Michmash, Aja, Bethel and its villages, Anathoth, Nob, Ananiah, Hazor, Rama, Gitaim, Hadid, Zeboim, Nebalat, Lod and Ono, the valley of Krasnam. And certain divisions of the Levites in Judah were assigned to Benjamin. These are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maloch, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Meramoth, Ido, Ginatoi, Abijah, Mijamin, Maadiah, Bilga, Shemaiah, Joyrib, Jediah, Salu, Amok, Hilkiah, Jediah. These were the chiefs of the priests and of their brothers in the, in the days of Joshua. And the Levites, Joshua, Binui, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who with his brothers was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. And Bakbakiah and Uni and their brothers stood opposite them in the service. And Joshua was the father of Joachim, Joachim the father of Elishib, Elishib the father of Jehoiada, Jehoiada the father of Jonathan, and Jonathan the father of Jadua. And in, the, and the, in the days of Joachim were priests, heads of fathers' houses, of Sariah, Moriah, and Jeremiah, Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshulam, of Amariah, Jehonan, of Malachi, Jonathan, and Shebaniah, Joseph, of Harim, Adna, of, Mer, of, of Merioth, Helkiah, of Ido, Zechariah, of Ginaton, Meshulam, of Abijah, Zikri, of Miniam, Miniamim, of Moadiah, Piltai, of Bilgar, Shamua, of Shemaiah, Jonathan, Je Jehonathan, of Joyrib, Matanai, of Jediah, Uzi, of Salai, Kalai, of Amok, Eba, of Hilkiah, Hashabiah, of Jediah, 
Nathaniel. In the days of Eliashib, Eliashib, Jehoiada, Jehanan, and Jaduah, the Levites were recorded as heads of fathers' houses. So too were the priests in the reign of Darius the Persian. As for the sons of Levi, their heads of fathers' houses were written in the book of Chronicles until the days of Jehonan, the son of Eliashib. And the chiefs of the Levites, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel, with their brothers who stood opposite them to praise and to give thanks according to the commandment of David, the man of God, watch by watch. Mataniah, Bakbakiah, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talmon, Akub, were gatekeep and Akub were gatekeepers standing guard at the storehouses of the gates. These were in the days of Joachim, the son of Jeshua, the son of Je Josadak, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest and scribe. Lord, we come to you. <clears throat> we pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us here this morning from this list of names and places many of which we struggle to even pronounce. But yet, from this passage, we believe, we have faith that you would speak to us today. So just take my thoughts, my preparations, Lord, and would you speak by your Holy Spirit? We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> it's very easy, <clears throat> like I said, a little bit earlier on it's very easier for us for us just to skip over sections like this in scripture because it's just a list of names it's almost a census isn't it and a list of places in part of the passage that we read it's a list of places um, where the children of, of Israel were at this time or certainly the two tribes but I hold to the scripture in 1 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16, sorry, that every scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for us, for teaching, instruction, correction, and so on. And so my heart, my longing, my prayer over these last two or three weeks is, Lord, what are you saying to us in, these, in the midst of all these names and the principles established here in these, um, in these sections? We have to remember that because the walls had been broken down, the children of Israel were not dwelling in Jerusalem as they were in previous generations. The chapter opens that it was just the leaders of the people who were living in Jerusalem at that time. The rest of the people were in the, the, the outlying surrounding villages and towns. And the people, it was important that the leaders were there in the, in the, in the environs of, the, of, the, of the, the, the city there, whilst all this building work was going on, because you'll remember they took responsibility, didn't they, to protect the work. They urged their, 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 their fellow children of Israel, they urged them to, to, to stand watch. But the, the, the Levites and the priests, they took responsibility. And they took their job seriously. They didn't just have an attitude of, well, I'm the priest. I'm going to let them get on with it. The priests and the Levites, they got stuck in as well. Not only with the building of the wall, but also involved in their protection. And so it was the leaders at this point in chapter 11 where we, where we're, where we have arrived at. It was the leaders that were living at that time in Jerusalem. And they cast lots in, in, in verse 1. To bring 10% of all the people living in the, in the area of, uh, of, of um, Judah and Benjamin. 10% of the people to come and also live in the city. Now it records for us in verse, uh, in verse 2 that, um, that there were those who willingly offered to come. And it says there that, that uh, the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. The suggestion there is it must have been some great sacrifice for them. They'd had to up sticks and move their, move their belongings and their family and so on to move into Jerusalem. And they did it willingly for the sake of God, for protecting the house of God and the city of God. <clears throat> there was a recognition by the people generally that they were making a huge sacrifice. We then get these lists of names, which I struggled through. 
Some of them are familiar to us. Familiar to us from the, the previous um, 10 chapters of the book. Some of them familiar to us because we, as we read the rest of Scripture, and, and this is one of the reasons I love to read these passages, because a name will jump out at us of, of maybe someone that we've been reading about in another part of Scripture, and it helps to put things into context. And so some of the names are familiar to us. And certainly the roles that are covered in this section that we've read today are very familiar to us. The priests, the Levites, the Nethanim or the temple servants, Solomon's servants and the gatekeepers. There's several references, particularly in this, in this second half of the, of the book. So as we go through um, this section, verses 4 to 9 give us the descendants of the two tribes of Israel. We're not concerned here, and the, and, the, and the narrative doesn't cover the other ten tribes, of course, but the two tribes um, were involved here at this point, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin. And it lists the, the, uh, the children of Benjamin and Judah. <clears throat> verses 10 to 14 give us the priestly families. From verse 15 to 18, it gives us the list of the Levites. 19 to 21 tell us about the gatekeepers, essential, of course, for protecting the city, guarding the city. And also it lists in that section the other temple servants. Verses 22 to 24 then give us the names of the overseers of those who served in temple worship. Chapter 11 then closes, verses 25 to, to 36, closes with a, a geography um, lesson, a list of the territories that we're talking about here, the territory of Judah going down as far as Beersheba and the territory of Benjamin which headed north from Jerusalem towards the area of Samaria. As we read this, and as we read this list of names of those in authority and positions that God had placed them in, and as we, as we, li as, as we list the area that it covered, it gives us a sense that things were coming back under control. You have to remember that the Israel as a nation, as a state, had ceased to exist because they had disobeyed God, because they had gone against God's laws and, and had not respected God's plans and his purposes for them. Because they had prostituted themselves with foreign gods, they were taken into captivity. They were overthrown and taken into captivity. So the state of Israel that was known at that time was no longer, no longer existed. They'd all been carried off, or many of them had been carried off as, uh, as slaves to Babylon and Assyria. And so what's happening as, as, as Zerubbabel came back in the book of Ezra and began work on the temple, and 80, I think it was 80 years later, Ezra came back, and then another 13 years, Nehemiah comes back to do the work that we've been considering in this book. And so over that period of nearly 100 years, things are starting to be restored according to God's plan. And as restoration is brought in, so order is brought in in the land. Of course, it's only these two, these two tribes that, uh, that we're considering here, Judah and Benjamin. But an element of order and structure resumes for God's people in God's kingdom. The first half of chapter 12 that we, that we, um, that we read goes into more detail of the leaders among the people. And that's why I've read these two sections together. Chapter 12 looks at the list, the, the detail of the list of priests and Levites in particular. Right back to when the restora restoration had begun under Zerubbabel, as I say, nearly 100 years previously. So in verses 1 to 9 of chapter 12, it lists the original pri priests who had come. Verses 10 and 11 list the high priests from the intervening period from Zerubbabel's day up to Nehemiah's day when this was written. Verses 12 to 21 list the priests who had served under Joachim, one of the high priests in that intervening period. And verses 22 to 26 lists some of the Levites during those periods as well. Now I've just given you a very brief snapshot over that uh, <clears throat> that section that we've just read pardon me but how does all this relate to us today 
Is it just a list of names and locations and nothing else? Is it just a historical record of what happened in Nehemiah's day? Or is there instruction for us today? It's a rhetorical question. You know the answer to that. There is instruction for us today. In every scripture, there is instruction for us today to be applied to our lives. I've titled this sermon, The Leaders Restored. You'll, if you go back and look over the bulletins, you'll see that each of the titles of the sermons involve the, the word restoration or restored. Here, the leaders are restored. That's the focus, that's the emphasis in this section. The lists of the priests, the Levites, the Nephilim and Solomon's servants and their overseers. I think we can deduce from reading chapter 11 and, and the first half of chapter 12, we can reduce that this was very important to Ezra and to Nehemiah. That as part of establishing order and structure in the land once again, coming back from the foreign lands, the temple re-established, the walls rebuilt, as part of all that order and structure, the, the leaders were established and in place. And it was written down. These events were recorded for us. Why? Is it because the leaders were of such great importance in the sense that they were a cut above the rest? Not at all. I think it instructs us, it reminds us that God is not a God of chaos, but a God of order, a God of structure. And he sets these roles in place to provide the spiritual oversight, the spiritual leadership for his people. And so it is today. I've been given, when I came here nine years ago, I was given the title of team pastor. I have to be honest with you, the title doesn't mean anything to me as such, really. It's, it's a helpful title, I guess, but I see myself as, as an elder. I'm one of the elders in this local church. And I'm not doing this role because it's a good career move. Or a good vocation to be in. It's because God has set these roles within the structure of the church. And he has called me to this role. I remember um, when I was um, in my early years in banking, I would do night school. And there was, uh, there was somebody, another bank clerk, was at the, in the same classes as me. And his father was a vicar in the Church of England. And somebody asked him, he said, well, why did you decide to go into banking? And he said, oh, my father said it wasn't a good career path to go into at the moment. Even back then, I was still a teenager at the time, even back then it, it filled me with a sense of, I think we're missing the point here. Going into church ministry is not about a career. Going into church ministry is not about, uh, about making a decision to, to, this is a good way to make money, to earn a living. I've told many of you before, I am a double introvert, whatever that might be. But I can tell you, I would not choose to stand here. I would not choose to be in this role, in this position, as an elder in this local church, but for the calling of God. And I don't say that presumptuously. Please understand that. I'm trying to apply the principles of why we have so much focus in these two sections of all the leaders within Israel of the spiritual oversight in the local church. And God has set roles within the structure of our local church and the church generally to provide leadership, to provide spiritual discernment, to provide oversight for his people, all under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. I think when we did that study last year, I think it was when we did that, that study on what is the church. I said to you that I, I don't, you know, one or two people call me vicar, jokingly. And I said to you, I don't like the title vicar. And please understand, I'm not bashing the Anglican church in all that I'm saying here. 
I'm just, it just happens that there are these two examples that I, that I want to share. But I don't like the title of vicar. It, it has the same root as the word vicarious. The concept of the vicar and the title vicar is the substitute for Christ, the one who stands in for Christ. I could never do that, nor could any other person on this planet. He is the head of the church. We as elders are under shepherds, therefore, of the good shepherd. And it must always remain that way. In God's ordering within his kingdom, in God's ordering within the church, that is the way he's established it. <clears throat> and whilst this was good in Nehemiah's day, so it is today. In Nehemiah's day, what we have established in chapter 11 and chapter 12 here are the priests, those who served in a particular way, those who received and, and, and made the offerings. Those, or the high priest, of course, was the one who entered into the presence of God only once a year. The Levites then were there to serve the priests, to support the priests, to help the priests. The temple servants, or the Nethanim, as some translations have it, then served the Levites. So there was this, this structure that was established. The priests, supported by the Levites, supported by the Nethanim. Also, there were Solomon's servants. And in this section, again, we get the gatekeepers referenced. The importance, I've mentioned it already, the importance of protecting what is precious to God. Everyone had their role. Everyone had their function within the assembly of the people of Israel. And it was all for the effective and smooth running of the kingdom of God. So as the temple was rebuilt, as the walls were rebuilt to protect the temple and to protect the city, so Nehemiah and Ezra, as they, as they scribe this, this account down, they record all these Levites and priests and, and temple servants and so on. All those who were involved in this great and important work as far as God was concerned. And so today we have New Testament principles laid down for us. For the effective and smooth running of the kingdom of God. For the effective and smooth running of the local church. We have pastors or elders. We have deacons who support the elders. There are others listed and, and described in the New Testament who we could perhaps put under the title, the scripture doesn't use this title, but we could perhaps put them under the title small group leaders. But then the wonderful thing in the economy, in the, in the system of the church, is that it doesn't stop there. You then have the congregation. All those who have been called by God. All those whose, whose hearts have been touched by the love and grace of our God. All those who know that their sins are completely forgiven, washed away in the precious blood of Christ. Every single one of you in this room who comes under that category is a priest before God. <laughs> we give it this fancy title in the church. We call it the priesthood of all believers. But that's the truth of it. Every one of you are priests. And I, I, I know I covered this off a couple of weeks, two or three weeks back. But, and, and every one of us who are blood-bought saints are priests before God. And we need to act like it. We need to be ready to, 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 to come before the almighty holy God on behalf of his people. We need to be ready to come to the people on behalf of the almighty, sin-hating, holy, majestic and gracious God of the universe. Hallelujah. And every one of us has a role to play in that. But there are these particular roles that scripture references. Pastors, elders, deacons. <clears throat> and as I say, this concept of small group leaders which is evident in the, in the epistles in particular. And it's all part of God's ordering for the smooth running of the local church. Now, you need to pray for your leaders. <clears throat> Today, more than ever, especially given the announcement that the trustees shared last week, you need to pray for your leaders. 
but especially in the coming months as the Lord raises up new elders in this church. Eldership is a great responsibility and it's a responsibility that most, if they're godly and therefore <laughs> becoming qualified to be elders, would shrink from it. Hebrews urges us, Hebrews 13 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. That's the element of responsibility involved in those in eldership. We have to give an account to God for those that we're, that we're keeping watch over. This is no light matter, but it's within God's ordering. So you need to pray for us that we discharge our responsibilities to the glory of God. Whether, it's, whether I'm talking about the elders in particular, which at the moment is just myself and Rodney helping me, supporting me, albeit from a distance. So the elders in particular because of our spiritual oversight of the congregation, but also the deacons and the trustees who have a practical legal function. And you need to pray that we discharge our responsibilities rightly to the glory of God, for his honour, for the building up of this local church. Nehemiah and Ezra, it's probably both of them writing this, um, this account, they saw the importance of the leaders in their day especially in a restored, renewed economy that, were, that Jerusalem was becoming at that time. As I've said already, the temple re-established, rebuilt, re-established. The walls rebuilt, restored to protect everything that is of, as of infinite pleasure to God. Let us, by application, let us recognise that the Lord is doing something very precious among us at the moment. I know this has been happening in some of the ladies' groups, but I'm not there, so I can't speak for them. But what I can speak for is that I am so encouraged by what God is doing in the men's groups at the moment. I commented on Saturday morning at the men's breakfast that only three months ago, Bob and I had a conversation in the elders' meeting and the, the, the attendance was so low, I was thinking of pulling the plug on the men's breakfast. We had 15 yesterday. And, and what, what delights me so much, it's not just about somebody sharing a 10-minute message at the end of breakfast, but they, they, they'll share a 2-minute, 5-minute, 10-minute message, whatever it may be. But then there's discussion right round the table sometimes for the next hour or so. And that's fantastic, that's wonderful. And, and, and talking with Dermot made the comment this morning that the, that the Thursday evening men's group has, it's not just stepped up a notch, it's stepped up several notches. And we've been able to minister to one another, pray for one another, support one another, encourage one another as men. And I know some of these things are happening in the ladies' groups as well. And this is fantastic. So I'm, I'm so excited by what God is doing in this fellowship at the moment. Even though we might have a financial crisis on our hands. Even though we might not have enough money to pay the pastor next month or whatever it is. I'm so excited by what God's doing. He's bringing people here who want to serve. Not volunteer. We don't do that at this church, do we? But they come because they want to serve God. And in serving God, serve the people of God here in this place. What is God doing here among us? He is renewing our hearts and restoring our hearts to himself. Which is exactly what he was doing to the children of Israel. As the walls were rebuilt, he was restoring their hearts to himself. An important part of that, that restoration, an important part of bringing that order, that structure, into what was previously chaos, an important part of that is godly leaders without ambition or agenda. Godly leaders who desire to see God's kingdom grow. Godly leaders who long to see Jesus high and lifted up in our community as we share the gospel with those around us. Godly leaders who long to know more of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Of course, I'm talking in particular about, about elders. And please pray as God raises up elders in these coming months to support me in, in this church. I'm also talking about deacons. But I'm talking about every one of you as priests in the house of God. As part of the priesthood of all believers. Do you have a longing to see God's kingdom grow? Do you have a longing to see Christ lifted up, exalted, presented as saviour of the world? Do you have a longing to know more of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit today? Not just as a, as a force or, or, or whatever it may be, but the person of God in the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, guiding us, leading us, empowering us. To be all that God has called us to be. It came into one of our songs this morning, didn't it? And this is my longing. This is my desire. As we see something of, of, of God move among us and we can, we can see it. We're part of what God is doing in this place, in this moment, for this time. Are you just sitting back and watching? Are you just observing what's happening? Are you even looking at things with a critical eye and saying, yes, it might be, might, things might be happening, but what about this and what about that? And what about the fact that the pastor wasn't wearing socks and shoes this morning? Well, that's only because it's so hot. Forgive me. I should have put shorts on today. I know I'm, I know I'm making light of, of that, but we become, we can, it's so easy to become critical, isn't it? And to look at all those little things, those, those little negative things, and fail to see the macro of what God is doing in this place. Amen. Of what God is doing in his church. So are you just sitting back and observing and watching? Or do you have a desire to see God's kingdom grow? Do you have a desire to, do you long to see Jesus presented to everybody in Camborne and Poole and Redruth as the saviour of the world? Do you long to know more of the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit today? Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for your provision for the church. Father, we're conscious we sometimes get worried about practical things. And, and yes, the money is important. But, oh God, I long for more in this, in this community, in this church, in this local church. For godly men and women to, 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 to desire to see your kingdom come in a greater way in this place. To know more of you, Holy Spirit, moving among us, prompting us, empowering us for all that you've called us to be and to do here in Camborne. Please help us, Holy Spirit. We need your power. We need your help. Lord Jesus, we need your inspiration. We need a fresh vision of you, Jesus, in all your glory. Father, we need to know more of your kingdom in this place. Would you minister to us now as we, as we worship you together? Minister to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dominic.